Welcome to everyone. This is Margaret Flowers with Populate Resistance, and we'll be starting in just a minute or two to give time for folks to join. And as you see in the chat, folks are sharing where they're coming in from, so feel free to do that. Welcome everyone to COVID-19. Let's go ahead and start the program. Okay, we're about ready to start. I think we have a tremendous group on and welcome. I'm so glad you've joined us for tonight's webinar, COVID-19, how weaponizing disease and vaccine wars are failing us. I'm Sarah Flounders, an editor and one of the 50 co-authors of Capitalism on a Ventilator, The Impact of COVID-19 in China and the US. It's published by International Action Center and the China-US Solidarity Network. And I'm joined tonight by a great panel of some really important co-authors of Capitalism on a Ventilator. My co-editor, Li Su Hin of the China-US Solidarity Network is here speaking to us from Shanghai and four of the authors of some significant chapters are joining this panel. Uh, Margaret Flowers, a doctor and pediatrician, co-founder with the much missed Kevin Zeese uh, and a co-director of, as co-director of Popular Resistance is here. Margaret is a co-host for tonight's program. And we're also joined by Margaret Kimberly of Black Agenda Report. Black Alliance for Peace, a senior editor of uh, Black Agenda Report, by Vijay Prashad, the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and by Max Blumenthal, the co-founder and editor of Gray Zone. So these are really uh, tremendous reporters, journalists, writers, activists that I'm sure many of you are already well familiar with. We wanted to meet after the new Biden administration to evaluate where we're at, evaluate the new vaccine distribution, what it means in the US and the world. 
uh, so restricted to the wealthiest countries, leaving out most of the world. We're discussing a recent book where the last piece was written as we went to press just over three months ago, and that seems an age in terms of the numbers. Some of the chapters reporting eight, nine months ago, even five months ago, it's staggeringly worse than any of us could have possibly foreseen, now reached in past 400,000 deaths and much worse is predicted. We're looking at a global pandemic, an escalating political, economic, and propaganda attack on China. We find that US capitalism is deeply threatened by a powerful country able to use socialist state planning in dealing with both a global capitalist crash and a global pandemic, and is now surging ahead in production while well, here we face great deterioration and it may get much worse. So part of that is a discussion today from the first days, the COVID-19 virus, when it was discovered, first discovered in China in late December of 2019, China rushed to alert the World Health Organization, all the countries of the world on a dangerous new virus. Even before the first death in China, the a DNA was identified, tests were prepared. And that's when I started following this crisis. Following it from the point of view, uh, and I think it's true for many of us tonight, I was interested in learning why and how China as a rapidly developing country that's building socialism, how they would utilize socialist planning in dealing with this new challenge. I was interested uh, in their stay in place freeze at the same time that they guaranteed paychecks and a hold on rents and mortgages and credit card payments, no fear of evictions, providing food deliveries, arranging mass testing. So little was being written on this that started collecting it and uh, exchanging it with others. So it's hardly surprising, but it's still shocking to watch the US response from both political parties. This was not only the response from Trump. And I think that's important to keep in mind now that there is a new administration. Rather than preparation in the US, there was an unprecedented wave of ridicule, criticism of China for taking extreme measures, open gloating, hoping that the virus outbreak would undermine confidence in the government, would lead to social chaos, predictions of mass social unrest at the quarantine measures, just an anti-China drumbeat that reached new heights, trade war, military encirclement, and here in the U.S., no preparation for mass testing, supplies, hospitals, or education of the po population, just ridicule. Two months later, when the virus hit, uh, I'm speaking to you from New Jersey, from Jersey City in New York and New Jersey, a wave, a spike so sharp from the shutdown on March 15th, I don't think any of us could ever forget the searing images of thousands of medical workers wearing rain ponchos, garbage bags, shower caps, bandanas, publicly pleading for PPE supplies, setting up their own GoFundMe pages, the absolute chaos of it all, no ventilators, respirators, it was a harrowing two months, but it seemed the rest of the country would then have full time to prepare, but there was no preparation. Preparation in the U.S., is it really possible when there's no health infrastructure? Every state, every city, every county, its own rules and guidelines on testing, on shutdowns, on masks, now on vaccines, no coordination. It's the profit system at its most ruthless. And profits in the pharmaceutical and medical and health industries are at an all time high. Closing of hospitals, there's mergers, there's layoffs. And all this, it isn't just the chaotic Trump administration. It isn't just racist right-wing ignorance. Will we have a bright new day now with Biden? Will we have mass vaccinations anytime soon? That's what we're evaluating tonight because for one, I fear that the attacks will get 
much worse with the new Biden administration and a whole new crew of anti-China nominees. Look at the cabinet. The appointment testimony of the war hawk, Anthony Blinken, nominated to serve as Secretary of State. It's one of many searing examples of a militarist stance. In his confirmation testimony, said on the war in Syria, US is not doing enough. On North Korea, unrelenting pressure, cut off all resources. He was for expanded deployment of missiles and surrounding and pressuring China from the South China Sea to missile batteries to Xinjiang province. And for new demands and continued sanctions on Iran, Venezuela, we should be really, really concerned. And then there's Kurt Campbell, who's appointed to the newly new position National Security Council for Indo-Pacific Coordinator. He's considered the architect of Obama's pivot to Asia. So, and how does the media call him? By the most arrogant, really outrageous name, he's Biden's Asia czar. What a racist description. His role is to integrate an anti-China strategy and strengthen US alliances in the region. So we have a lot to take up tonight. Uh, we've all been assured that there was gonna be a quick solution to this health disaster with the vaccine. We'll have to really see and think about that, especially from the view of who's hit hardest with the vaccine, who, who, who's hit hardest with the virus and who gets the vaccine and who will find it in short supply. So I wanna, open with uh, asking Su Hin Li, who's speaking to us from Shanghai, to please come on to tell us how conditions are where you are. Su Hin was in China last year, then he was here in Los Angeles for the first six months of this uh, COVID virus, and then back in China for the last five months. So able to make comparisons and really uh, tell us firsthand how things are in Shanghai and in China today. Thank you, Su Hin. Of the China-US Solidarity Network. I know uh, Su Hen was having trouble with his uh, computer for the connection from Shanghai to here. Are you, are you there, Su Hen? If not, we'll go on and come back to you. Hello? All right, I think we'll have to come back. This was the interesting challenge, even in pulling this book together across continents and oceans and yet so possible to do. So I'm sure we'll hear from Suhin in just a little bit. Um, so let me ask the members of our panel, not sure who would, uh, perhaps I can call on Margaret Kimberly uh, on sort of our opening question, which is how is COVID-19 being weaponized and what, if any changes do you expect under the Biden administration? And we want to hear from each of our panelists. Uh, and then we'll go into a second round of questions. Okay. Uh, I can't start the video, Sarah. Start my video. Ah, there I am. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so very much for. Uh, joining us, for joining us this evening. Um, I want to start by thanking Sarah, Sarah Flounders and Lee Su Hin for putting together this anthology, Capitalism on a Ventilator. Uh, I'm very proud to have been included among the contributors. Uh, it's, uh, it was last January, it's just about one year ago that we first heard of this new disease said to have originated in China. We didn't know much about it, except that we knew it was communicable. 
Uh, and in February of 2020, the word severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2 came into the lexicon and our lives have not been the same since then. It's an understatement to say that in this country, we had terrible leadership on this issue, particularly in the person of Donald J. Trump, president of the United States. He lived up to the worst expectation of his detractors and he bears responsibility for the early response, which included a faulty test and an overall lack of urgency. But it's too easy to blame Trump alone. All we have to do is look at the rest of the world, how various governments responded and what the outcomes have been. At this time, there, have, there are more than 400,000 deaths from coronavirus disease in the United States. The federal government and state governments have lurched from assuring us that we were safe to then shutting down businesses and decimating the economy only to reopen when big business wants workers to return. Cases rise and the cycle of indecision and incoherence continues. Americans are particularly vulnerable because many of them cannot access health care at all. It may be connected to their employment, but then they lose their jobs in the wake of the shutdowns. Or they never had it at all, as many so-called essential workers have experienced. These essential workers are less likely to have health coverage or to have the ability to work remotely and escape the risk of close contact. But in this nation, the patchwork of for-profit healthcare doesn't serve anyone very well. The best outcomes have come from socialist nations. Trump and even Joe Biden have blamed the Chinese government at one point having a, uh, um, a who can hate China more debate. And, but despite all of the negative propaganda, China told the world what we were dealing with by mid-January in 2020. China's had fewer than 5,000 deaths, and I am rounding up. No deaths there had been recorded for months since last May until very recently. A recent outbreak is in the small hundreds of people and China has responded once again, as it did one year ago. They are building hospitals, especially for COVID patients and stopping the spread. They have a tremendous capacity for testing, which has also stopped the spread all of the, no, of the nations with low case numbers have done likewise. The US and also the UK, which once had a robust public healthcare system now uh, decimated by austerity, have had terrible numbers of, of the ill and the dead. Biden comes to office promising to listen to the science. At the same time, he says that the trajectory of contagion is what it is, and we can expect to have 200,000 more deaths in this country. The non-system healthcare system hasn't gone away, neither has disagreement about how and whether to open schools and get people back to work. That has been the emphasis here, getting people back to work by giving them only meager amounts of one-time support, First, just $1,200, then $600, a promise of $2,000 by Biden, which has now morphed to just $1,400, and we won't see that for several months. The emphasis is the same, bail out big business and diminish anger with small handouts instead of giving ongoing support as many other countries have done. The term disaster capitalism comes to mind, but perhaps those words are redundant. Capitalism always inflicts disaster, but when a new opportunity ar arises to take advantage, the system always does so. It's though easy to make heroes out of people like Dr. Anthony Fauci, who now speaks publicly about his difficult experiences trying to work with Trump, but we can't fall back on cheap praise either because someone is seen as a Trump antagonist. Fauci was among those who assured us we didn't need masks only to reverse course months later and insist that we do. He says he and others were concerned that there wouldn't be enough protective equipment for medical professionals. That could have been handled with a dose of truth, but we live in a country with little to offer except capitalist predation and the country that has been blamed is the one that produces the bulk of protective equipment that does exist. This is not about personalities. This moment is about systemic failure. If we didn't know it before, we know that the US is a failed state with the capacity to make guns, but not to help people. At the same time, Americans are still 
kept in the dark about ad advances in countries such as Cuba, where a vaccine is being produced, where treatments have kept the death toll low. In spite of continued sanction, that nation rises to the occasion, sending medical teams all over the world. It is countries like China and Cuba which show us the way. COVID has been weaponized, weaponized to keep the rich rich and to keep the people under control. The system did not change because we have a new president. The US is still in for a long fight against COVID-19 itself and against the system, which is always used as a tool of oppression. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Margaret, thank you. Uh, let me ask also for uh, our many viewers, if you have specific uh, questions that you'd like to add, please do so in the Q&A and not in the chat uh, because we really won't be dealing with them there in the chat. So uh, put uh, any questions in the Q&A. And I see that uh, Lee Su Hin has been able to join us. So um, welcome and let me uh, introduce uh, Lee Su Hin from the China US Thank you. Solidarity Network. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, just like a Zoom conference call between uh, China and US, and it could be uh, chopping and sometimes even uh, breaking. There's been many information what happened in China this moment. People in US are not getting from the corporate media. I back to Shanghai on September from Los Angeles at the first, so for the first height of the pandemic in the US. And then I seeing the situation getting worse to even worse in US. When I was in, when I in China, I get them better and life back to normal. But I want to say what is not just a luck, but it's a, what has been the country as a whole, a system, China as a socialism and the determination to mobilize people to fight the virus and also the determination from people across the country to believe in science, believe in determination that we can win this war that may that's why the China can beat the COVID and back to normal. So uh, I want to say one good uh, uh, since January that has been scattered of the uh, COVID happened across the country from north to south also in Shanghai, where currently I am living. So I want to give some good, good example how I've been seeing and then have been government has been responding quickly. Uh, two weeks ago has been a uh, uh, city uh, where I live that's probably two miles from where I live has found two people. And uh, when they visit the hospital, and they uh, find the COVID, uh, they find the COVID patients, and then more quickly they launch a red. Just only even two people, they've been launching a red rapid response, mobilized roughly three thousand medical workers and volunteers within overnight, and then they seal off where they live and the neighborhood, just a small part of the neighborhood that like, uh, is an old town of the Shanghai and uh, roughly uh, 10 to 15,000 people and still off the community within less than a uh, few hours and to once then uh, everyone the 15,000 residents of this small neighborhood need to do the test immediately within less than 20, uh, two days everyone done the test and then uh, and then uh, they need a uh, uh, government uh, order. The whole neighborhood need to be uh, quarantined for 14 days because it's an old neighborhood and then very packed uh, neighborhood. So they quickly decided that 
they want uh, they want to make sure that uh, in a safe and uh, humanable uh, quantity, so they mobilize the uh, uh, the the warrant, uh, mobilize hotels quarantine hotels to housing almost everyone, thousands of people to quickly move to the quarantine hotels for 14 days quarantine. So the everyone's highly cooperative and then many volunteers and many community support and that the whole thing run extremely smoothly. There have been the same thing happened from the North to South that people are supporting each other's Volunteer, uh, volunteers are coming very fast. All these uh, uh, medical supplies and the logistics are come very quickly. And then the spirit, uh, specifically the spirit has been very, very high. That's how China fight the virus. That's how community support the government to fight the virus. And then that's a reason why time by time, each time they, we can stop the spread of the virus to across the country. Three weeks from now will be the Lunar New Year or Chinese New Year, it will be a year of ox. And because what the lesson learned from the January 2020, the human traffic across the country with asymptomatic patient could be a, a major, major uh, potential disaster for spreading the virus. That's at least that now government is a launching campaign across the country that asking people not to go into trouble and uh, the uh, uh, Chinese New Year, just like Christmas, many people working uh, uh, on different city want to going back to their hometown for the holiday. And so they are uh, 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 convincing people across the country to this year, uh, stop going back to the uh, hometown, stay, in the, stay at where they live. So, uh, to, so that can be preventing the spread uh, the virus. It will be, uh, uh, and uh, it's that the, I'm talking about hundreds of millions of people uh, 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 now choose to stay in where they work and uh, uh, not going back to hometown to prevent the spread the, uh, the disease uh, potentially, potentially because uh, there's uh, very few people in China now has the, uh, the, the disease, but uh, they want to be make sure that even this small possibility of chance won't be happen. In compare with that's the reason why, why US and UK and many other country during the Christmas period, they did not try, to, they did not listen to government's uh, uh, warning and stay at home. They choose to going back uh, vacation or going back to home for the holiday. And that's what happened to the latest surge and outbreaks of the mass outbreak uh, uh, of the virus COVID in US and Europe and the United Kingdom. That's the reason that the, the determinations and also trust in science and uh, together we can fight the virus. The, all this ideology, all this thinking are different between China and many other countries and also the belief a uh, political belief system in different the socialist can, why socialist systems can do it and capitalist system cannot do it. And I want to make sure I want to mention recent outbreak of only a few hundred to thousand people across the country has been the, been the worst since the uh, last year. Almost all the cases has been can trace back from the uh, import from outside the China, which is mean that have been uh, e either the person uh, uh, trouble ba uh, uh, coming back to China carry the virus and spread to the community. And according to the latest uh, uh, research uh, in Shanghai area, the most of uh, most uh, uh, travel uh, uh, foreigners have been carrying the virus back to China and, uh, and have been detected at the airport was coming from US 
in Canada. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, because the U.S. and Canada had a very high infection rate, but also there have been a raising a, a interesting and a troubling questions because right now the passengers, international tr passengers, need to have the COVID test before they can take a flight to coming back to China or many other countries. If they had took the negative test, how? How come when they fly back to China, they would test positive? That means raise a very uh, important question that the COVID tests in US are not reliable, not have been not reliable before and not reliable right now. That's the reason why this, uh, uh, the virus spread so quickly. And other things has been uh, uh, on Chinese media has been talk, uh, been discovered and the scientists has been talking about for months, not only human trans transmission, but also tran uh, have been uh, issue of the, the COVID virus transmit to the, uh, the packaging, the cold chain, the, uh, you can, uh, also so-called uh, uh, frozen food from uh, international shipment. Last couple of months, the customs in uh, China has been discovered. Many cases of food import from uh, foreign countries, from fruit for, to ice cream, to soda, to beer, to even a, a, a express mail, the packaging and uh, meat has been uh, found the COVID virus. Uh, the, or find the, uh, the stain of the COVID. That what that mean that the workers could be working on the plant had the COVID and then uh, contaminated the package and the food. And then uh, because of cold chain and then shipped to other country and then, con uh, and then spread the disease. That been, that's the reason right now, the customs uh, uh, in a different part of China that are now more focused on testing every shipment from foreign country that if they, uh, they carry the COVID. That's have not been talked about around the world and also need to be uh, careful. Everyone need to be really, really uh, look for that the, uh, the packaging and the shipment has, to, if that's going also the testing, all these things. Why? The capitalism don't care about the human's lives. The workers get then COVID and still working and then contaminate the food. And then the food, the contaminated food and the packaging has shipped around the world. That's what has been happening on the meat industry in the US and also have been Amazon warehouse workers where tens of thousands of workers has been infected. And then when they're working, they contaminated the packaging and this packaging shipped around the country and all around the world and then infected the people. That's uh, also we need, uh, uh, that's a Western media not talking about, and we should also looking into it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suhan. And there's a whole new area to really worry about how even the packaging, even the Amazon, the meat packing uh, can help, can spread this virus. Uh, this is sort of incredible, and, and it is where science and cooperation come in. Uh, let me go now to uh, Vijay Prashad. Welcome. So honored that you're participating in this program and in the book, and you've written extensively uh, on COVID-19, on the vaccine, on the, uh, China, on here, on around the world, India. Uh, so uh, the, the, that first question was, how is COVID-19 being weaponized and what, if any changes, do you expect under the Biden administration? Welcome, Vijay. Thanks a lot. Um, I can't, uh, I need to get permission to start my video. So, oh, okay, oh. there we go. Thanks. Um, yeah. It's very good to be here. Thanks a lot. And I'm glad to participate um, with you all. Um, it's a been an interesting 12 months, 13 months, really. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the pandemic itself. 
I would encourage people to go also, apart from getting the book, to go to the website of the Tricontinental. We did four studies that I want to turn your attention to. The first was called China and Corona Shock, where my colleagues in Shanghai and Beijing and myself, we went pretty forensically through um, China's response to the coronavirus in order to dispel the um, racist uh, you know, uh, onslaught or the information war from the Trump administration. Um, not only Trump, but of course, the um, man who was in the lead of this is, was Mike Pompeo. Um, and so that was the first text I'd very much like people to see. We did a text on the issue of Venezuela during the, um, during the pandemic. Uh, the most recent text we did, uh, the two of them, one was called Corona Shock and Socialism, comparing the impact of uh, government policy and public action as well in uh, Vietnam, Kerala, Venezuela, and Cuba with the rest of the, the world, mostly the bourgeois governments in the world. And we found that in these countries, in Cuba, um, you know, in uh, Venezuela, Kerala, and in Vietnam, we found the uh, four distinguishing marks of differentiation was that in these countries, governments uh, took the science seriously. They didn't have a hallucinatory attitude towards what the WHO was saying. Uh, secondly, they had a public sector that they could engage to produce simple things like masks, um, hand sanitizer, and so on, basically to uh, break the chain of the infection. These societies also had public action. You know, in many parts of the uh, bourgeois, where bourgeois governments reign in, in the capitalist bloc, we see public action essentially commodified through the role of NGOs and so on. But in many of these other societies where there's a socialist process, um, we see public action. You know, there are uh, political organizations, there are trade unions, women's organizations, student organizations, but also, of course, neighborhood groups and so on. You know, people have a very erroneous attitude of China, believing there's just a state. Uh, there's a great deal of public action, including neighborhood committees. And in Cuba, of course, the committees to defend the revolution, um, the role of public action was very important in breaking the chain of infection. And finally, uh, the fourth distinguishing feature was that in these socialist countries, or at least in these places where there's a socialist project, um, we see the um, importance of internationalism, not a racist response, you know, so that uh, China, Cuba, they export, sent doctors overseas. And this is the reason why I'd like you to visit the website of Cuba Nobel very important to fight to get the Cuban doctors of the Henry Reeve Brigade the uh, Nobel Prize for Peace for this year. Very important. Um, that's half of what I want to talk about. I want to just raise two issues, put them on the table, because the question is asked, how will the Biden administration respond? And, you know, honestly, on these two issues that I want to focus on now, the Biden administration has remained largely silent. Uh, so what are these two issues? One is what I think we should start thinking about as money apartheid. These are going to be two forms of apartheid. This is money apartheid. And the second is the vaccine apartheid. I'd like to put these directly on the table. And, you know, it's interesting. Biden administration said a lot of things, including Antony Blinken, the you know nominee for uh, Secretary of State, has said that, you know, Trump was right on China and so on. There's a lot of evidence of what they most likely will do. But on these two issues, on money apartheid, vaccine apartheid, they've been silent, which means they won't do much, but just allow this to continue as normal, as most American governments do, if we're absolutely honest. What is money apartheid? Well, you know, um, the central banks in the capitalist countries have opened the spigot. Interest rates in the United States are below zero. Money is being handed out to corporations basically um, for, with no consideration. You know, they can just come to the window of the Federal Reserve and money pours out at them. Uh, meanwhile, uh, right now we see the external debt in dollars, but not only in dollars, the external debt of developing countries is somewhere in the vicinity of $11 trillion. Now, this is a perfect time for debt forgiveness. Um, after all, there's $37 trillion sitting in um, illicit tax havens. So that's three times the amount of the total external debt of developing countries. This 
in a pandemic situation like this should be immediately forgiven it's not being forgiven um in fact these countries are not even able to postpone debt payments um uh, right now we estimate that by now another 12 or so months uh, the total debt servicing coming from the countries of the developing world will be about 3.9 billion that's 3.9 billion to service the debt of 11.7 roughly trillion dollars so sorry 3.9 trillion dollars to service the debt of about 11.7 trillion um this is going to be demanded of these countries in the next 12 months and thereabouts 60 countries of this block of 122 or developing countries 60 half of them are paying more to service their debt than for health care in the middle of a pandemic uh, this is this is money apartheid because half of uh, the countries of the developing south are spending more to service the debt to the northern banks and to bondholders wealthy bondholders then to pay for health care in the middle of a pandemic meanwhile central banks in the west are opening the spigot for their corporations so the first thing i want to put on the table is money apartheid the second one of course is vaccine apartheid uh, the head of the who uh, said recently that there's a catastrophic moral failure in the world it's very strong words he used catastrophic moral failure because frankly most of the world's population 3 to 4 maybe 5 billion people may not see a vaccine till next year maybe the year after that i mean in uh, in the west people are complaining vaccine rollout has been slow and so on okay fine vaccine rollout has been slow but in many parts of the world they will not see a vaccine uh, they may see it in one or two years by which time you know who knows what's going to happen so tedros quite rightly said there's a catastrophic moral failure because vaccine nationalism uh, pushed by the wealthier parts of the world um, this vaccine nationalism is going to really destroy um, any equitable vaccine delivery um i have to say that underlying this vaccine nationalism is about 50 years of the destruction of public sector pharmaceutical industry around the world you know by the way this includes the clinton administration's bombing of the al shifa um the al shifa uh, pharmaceutical factory in khartoum sudan you may remember this they said it's a chemical weapon plant it's the only pharma industrial plant in sudan was bombed by the clinton administration never rebuilt um so that's just a terrible example but there's been an attrition of pharmaceutical production in the developing south because they've been told well buy drugs elsewhere or if you produce them you produce them for the global commodity chain so countries like india will produce the vaccine but they'll be gone to another country they cannot vaccinate people in india so the second issue is a vaccine apartheid which has come into place very strongly uh, and there seems to be no exit from this so you know sarah to your question biden administration this that and the other they may do a lot of things that are better than trump maybe i don't know i'm not interested in that right now what i'm interested in is in these two key issues for the survival of billions of people around the planet the question of the external debt of the developing countries amounting to 11.7 trillion and the lack of access to vaccines these two issues on this the biden administration is silent it will do nothing it's going to allow this apartheid to continue it's going to allow essentially the same sort of north south policies um, to be in place and i think for this there needs to be a lot of noise made around the world in order you know to overcome the catastrophic moral failure that's the phrase tedros used the head of the who it's a catastrophic failure he said it in context of the vaccine i think that's too limited it's in the it should be said there's a catastrophic moral failure in the context of the vaccine and money money i want to repeat this and then i'll leave you i want to repeat this 60 countries around the world are spending more right now to service debt to wealthy bond holders they're spending more on that than they are spending on healthcare in their own societies thanks a lot wow such a such a damning indictment thank you vijay uh catastrophic moral failure 
And uh, along with money apartheid, we have 39 countries, a third of the world sanctioned and cut off from any uh, of the medicine and aid and assistance they desperately need, vaccine apartheid. Let me bring in Max Blumenthal and uh, addressing the same question, uh, which you've very much been dealing with uh, in gray zone. So Max, welcome. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thanks for inviting me to this webinar. And uh, it's never been more timely to have this conversation. I guess I want to talk about some of the work we've done over the past year, specifically on Latin America. So much of what we do at the gray zone is related to combating the information wars that the West and specifically the United States through the State Department and its force multipliers wages on countries in the global South that are targeted for regime change because of their uh, independence or their socialist economic systems. And the pandemic has created opportunities for the US and its media stenographers to amplify this information war, specific countries in the Western hemisphere and Nicaragua. And we've had the opportunity um, at the gray zone to visit and cover elections in Venezuela, recently the legislative elections that took place this winter and the um, basically reversal of the Bolivian coup took place in October in two countries that were one country that was hit disproportionately hard by COVID-19 and another country that has been hit particularly hard by the US information war related to COVID-19. And the information war is just one part of the hybrid war that the US is waging around the world most strongly and forcefully against China, which I guess is the main source of this conversation. And I'll, I'm, I guess I'll end. Um, I would really encourage everyone to go to thegrayzone.com and read or uh, watch my interview with Venezuelan Vice President Bez who is not only in charge of the new anti-blockade law and new mechanisms for circumventing the effects of the US economic blockade, but also has overseen uh, weekly briefings on the pandemic, various experimental protocols that Venezuela has put in place. And so you can hear her remarks for yourself as she details what they did on the ground as soon as they were aware in Venezuela that a pandemic was on their hands. And that awareness arrived much more rapidly than it did in the United States. This was keeping scorn on China and specifically the city of Wuhan for the um, lockdown measures it painted as authoritarian and draconian. Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro had just returned from a trip in January. And as soon as he learned about what was happening in China from his partners in the Chinese government, he in coronavirus task force in Venezuela. Um, within days or weeks, Venezuela began a national campaign of monitoring symptoms. And then within that pool million, they began to implement testing and they received testing kits thanks to their close relationship with Russia and China more rapidly as aligned nations in like Colombia, for instance, right next door, which has been hit especially hard by COVID-19. Um, through the testing, Venezuela then began isolating citizens in hotels uh, who had asymptomatic symptoms or put them in public hospital face symptoms and began treating them as much as they could. Um, and the virus spread this summer in Venezuela because so many people were coming back from the upper classes, the middle and upper classes who are supported from places like Italy that were hit very hard by the pandemic. 
And so measures were put into quarantine, people coming back in who were bringing the virus in or who were coming back across the Colombian border or from places like Ecuador and Brazil, where the gov you had US-backed governments that were basically doing nothing. And the New York Times comes in and writes these stories being put in concentration camps, relying on anonymous uh, residents of these quarantine facilities, hyping up the most you know, disturbing news possible to paint Venezuela as this gigantic failure. And of course, hoping for social chaos as a result of the pandemic, which never happened. Um, CNN, while I was in Venezuela with Anya Parampil, uh, covering the legislative elections, which were fraud without any evidence by US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, CNN sent one of its State Department stenographers in, um, a correspondent named Asa Suarez, who is you know an upper class Latin American like everyone else at CNN who covers the continent. And she produced one of the most propagandistic pieces I've ever seen about COVID-19, which presented harsh images from a dirty public hospital and uh, interview with a doctor who said that Venezuela was conducting a gigantic cover-up of its statistics and that everybody was dying and that people were afraid to get involved in the system of uh, treatment and isolation. What she didn't say was that that doctor was named Ricardo Villas Mil, and he was the head of Juan Guaido's COVID-19 task force. And basically his job was to propagandize with a stethoscope around his neck against the Venezuelan government. So giant omission there, the piece barely profiled the hotels and facilities that Venezuela had set up for people who were, who had tested, were tested and were asymptomatic. Uh, and then one other thing CNN neglected to mention in this report, which you can actually find on CNN's website elsewhere, is that according to CNN's global tracker, which is based on statistics kept main, uh, maintained by Johns Hopkins University. Um, you, you just go to uh, the interactive map on CNN.com tracking coronavirus's global. Venezuela is at the bottom globally of cases per 100,000 citizens with zero to 829. Of course, the countries that are at the highest are the ones that are home to CNN is the one that is home to CNN's broadcast facilities. So the information war was also waged. Uh, the Washington Post proclaimed that Nicaragua, this is in April, was doing nothing to combat the spread of the coronavirus. That was because Nicaragua had a very low number of cases. And the photograph that was beneath the headline on this article about oh, a caravan, an educational caravan um, that the Sandinista party, the governing socialist oriented party of Nicaragua was um, to neighborhoods across Managua to educate people about this new virus, which they knew nothing about how, why they should be washing their hands, sanitizing, social distancing, wearing masks and so on. And they said that that caravan was actually threatening people and spreading the virus. The reality was that was the last Sandinista caravan of mess every week. And it hadn't actually, it, it was, the photo was taken two weeks before. So it was a complete lie, but it was also a the government was doing. And what was also left out was that the right-wing opposition in Nicaragua, which hails from the upper classes, was spreading using Facebook to spread misinformation about school closures and trying to use the virus to spread complete social chaos across society. You have an interesting phenomenon where much of the economy exists in the informal sector. I mean, this is across Latin America, a key factor in understanding these administer their protocols. Uh, the Sandinista party's base is in the informal sector. These are vendors. These are people who are subsistence farmers, campesinos. They live day to day. And so how can you put them under lockdown in a very poor country? It's very difficult to do so. And so 
Nicaragua had to flexibilize its response as Venezuela does. Venezuela has a flexible response where it will allow people for a week or be out in the street for a week or two. And then there's two weeks of lockdown. Uh, Nicaragua tried to limit the lockdown until many people started bringing the cases in from the out and later in the summer, the lockdowns got a little more serious, but Nicaragua has been able to do just like Venezuela through its CLAP program, which provides practically free food and free sanitary supplies is to actually provide for citizens through its public health care system, which we don't have in the United States, and through um, various uh, hunger relief programs, free food, things like that, to allow people to not work. Meanwhile, in Colombia, uh, we ran an article on this at the Gray Zone, an on-the-ground report by a reporter named Nash Landsman. Families who were put under lockdown were actually hanging red flags out of their windows to indicate that they were dying from starvation because they were provided with no relief in this country, which is trying to follow World Health Organization guidelines, but isn't providing its citizens with any relief at all. It was the same across the Northern Triangle in Central America, uh, where um, uh, Naim Bukele from uh, El Salvador, um, Juan Orlando Hernandez, uh, right-wing U.S.-backed leaders were basically sending our barriers into markets and tear gassing people who kept working during the law. Uh, Guatemala declared emergency law and people were forced to stay at home with absolutely, uh, absolutely no assistance at all. In Bolivia, in fact, the right wing did absolutely nothing. I really recommend everyone check out our report by Ali Vargas, who works at Kausachun News. It is the uh, official news agency of the Coca Growers Union in Bolivia. And he reported on how people in the tropic region of Bolivia to herd immunity because the government did nothing. All the industries and the public health system basically collapsed. And so they were turning to um, traditional and eucalyptus and things like that to treat themselves. They've just wiped out anybody who was vulnerable did that response with the response of Cuba, which has now appeared to have developed a vaccine. Our media has not conveyed this reality to us. Instead, it's basically using its power to amplify what is a uh, warlike response to COVID, exploiting a pandemic to weaken further states that are targets of regime change. And what we've seen is that they've failed, just as they've failed sanctions, just as they have failed with uh, the coup attempt in Venezuela. And here's where I wanna point to Biden's expected response. It's pretty clear to me that the Biden administration, based on statements from National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, and others administration, want to use Trump's sanctions that he's piled up on countries like Venezuela or Iran, towards Iran, or the various hostile policies applied towards China as leverage. And they don't want to get rid of that leverage right away, getting under a kind of delusion that the world is the same as the one that was left to Trump a left office. And what they fail to understand is that these countries, through their experience with Trump and the intensification of hybrid warfare, have developed new mechanisms, economic, social, and military, new weapons to combat the effects of hybrid warfare, are more independent, are more sovereign, and are more able to fight back. The Biden administration continues this hostile policy. And in that sense, uh, there is hope. That's the end of my comments. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Max. And I, I now wanna bring in uh, Margaret Flowers, who uh, I wanna ask her to take it from here, but so many points that have been raised, I think just um, show two different approaches, one based on socialist solidarity, on cooperation, on science, 
uh, on having a view of the world and then what we're faced with here, which is a crisis here and spreading it around the world. So Margaret, let me hand it over to you. Um, and I, I just think you have so many insights on this as, as a doctor, along with as uh, the with popular resistance with the radio program and, and so much commentary, but a very personal feeling on public health. Great, thank you much, so much, Sarah. And thank you to all of our panelists for that first round of responses and to all of the participants for being here today. Uh, so as Sarah mentioned, I'm a medical doctor, a pediatrician. I practiced for 17 years, but it's been a few years now since I, I have practiced. But I just wanted to start out this portion of the program where we're gonna go into the vaccines a little bit, that vaccines are a fundamental uh, tool for public health. And uh, if we really want to get this disease under control, as we have with so many other infectious diseases, it's critical that we have effective vaccines and that we get these out to the people uh, so that we can start to build up an immunity in the population that prevents the spread of the, of the virus. And we know that we need very high rates of immunity, 70, 80, maybe 90% immunity to really curtail the, the spread of this virus. So I wanna remind people that the virus that causes COVID-19 is a new virus. We're still learning a lot about it. And one reason it's so important to get it under control is that some of the things that we've seen so far show that you know this is a very serious situation. For example, um, in children, they have been finding a condition similar to what we know as Kawasaki disease. It's an inflammatory condition that children have been uh, having because of being infected with COVID-19. And this causes impact on the heart. And so this is serious you know, for young children and a serious risk for them. We're also seeing people who develop what's now being come, becoming known as long COVID. So these are people who continue to have symptoms for months on end after becoming infected with COVID-19. And then finally, we're seeing in um, adult population chronic disease as a result of infection with the COVID-19 vaccine. So inflammatory heart disease kidney disease, liver disease, diabetes mellitus. So uh, in fact, there's a, a new study that's come out of the United Kingdom. It hasn't appeared in a peer reviewed journal quite yet, but just looking at the numbers, what's interesting from it is that they found that 30% of the patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19 were re-hospitalized within five months with things like heart disease, kidney or liver liver disease, and one in eight of these patients died. This is following their infections. They're no longer infected, but they have these ongoing impacts. So they estimated there was a three and a half time greater likelihood of someone dying after they've been infected with COVID-19 compared to the population, a similar population that was not infected with uh, or the virus SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19. So for this reason, it's really important that we continue to try to get a handle on this virus. The more that it spreads, the more likely it is to mutate. We're already seeing mutations. This is a typical event with viruses, uh, but it can mutate in ways that you know, we can't predict that can, can cause things that we don't know what they're going to do. We've already seen uh, mutations that are causing it to be more infectious. Um, it could become more lethal. It could also become less lethal. We don't know, but it's a risk that we take the more that we allow this to proliferate in our communities. And so as long as the virus exists somewhere in the world, it puts the world at risk that it can, you know, break out to other areas and spread. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, for this reason, it's really critical that we have this global cooperation, this global solidarity, sharing of information, sharing of resources to try to get a handle on what is really a very global problem. And to that effect, uh, on using the World Health Organization, 190 countries have come together and created what's called COVAX, which is a mechanism of storing doses of COVID-19 vaccines and then of those 190 countries, I think there are 92 countries that are low or middle income who qualify to get access to these vaccines. And of those 92, 
86 have already submitted plans for how they would distribute the vaccine to their population. So this is a really critical uh, structure to deal, start to deal with this vaccine apartheid that VJ mentioned. And under the Trump administration, you know, the, the United States left the World Health Organization. The Biden administration has now re-entered that. This is a positive step, I would say, with one caveat in the uh, directive about rejoining the World Health Organization, the United States talks about wanting to take a leadership role and reform that institution. That always makes me a little bit concerned when the US wants to be at the leadership of these. I think it really needs to be um, a shared leadership and recognizing that other countries like China that have a philosophy of the global good that's contradictory to what the United States typically does when it's involved in the leadership of these institutions. And, and I just wanted to quickly mention that, you know, after this outbreak of the pandemic, we did see many countries coming together and cooperating, countries like Cuba, sending the Henry, Henry Reeve Medical Brigade physicians out to assist, China sending supplies to so many countries, countries sharing what they had. At the same time, what the United States was doing was escalating military aggression, escalating unilateral coercive measures to make it more difficult for other countries to be able to purchase medication, supplies, food, all those types of things. And I wanted to mention that in the Biden administration executive orders, there is language about looking at the sanctions uh, to determine whether they've become a, a hinder, a hindrance to countries being able to deal with the pandemic. And that looks like a good thing, but if you look at the language that they're using, uh, it may be that the United States can say, oh, well, we've looked at these sanctions and we don't think they're actually having an impact, so we're not going to change anything. So we need to really be pushing uh, the Biden administration to end these illegal economic coercive measures that are causing deaths. We've documented at their studies, they're causing deaths in these many countries. Um, so I just wanted to look at a little bit again of how the United States has responded through this past year to the vaccines that are being made to this kind of vaccine war. And in March of this year, or of last year, we remember that the US government tried to purchase the rights to the vaccine that was being produced by a company in Germany called CureVax. And the reason the US wanted to buy the rights to that is so that the US could make sure that the US would have it not necessarily to share with other countries. Um, that was stopped Germany, the German government stepped in and said that wasn't going to happen. In May of last year, John C. Demers, he's the Assistant Attorney General for National Security, uh, was putting out a strong message saying, oh, we have to be very afraid of China. China is gonna try to steal our intellectual property for their own vaccines, our research. And so alert, alert, watch out for China trying to steal our research. And this is part of that hybrid war, that information warfare against China. In June of last year, the United States refused to collaborate with China on the research and development of vaccines. This is unprecedented. When the United States was in a Cold War with Russia, they continued to collaborate on issues of global concern. And in fact, even around the eradication of disease, particularly smallpox and malaria. So uh, normally when you know there are breakdowns in, in relations between countries, there's still this uh, sharing and, and collaboration when it comes to these global problems. And then in August, when Russia announced that its vaccine was going into uh, clinical trials, there are all kinds of headlines in the United States uh, saying you know, all kinds of things about Russia and questioning their integrity of their, of their vaccine research and you know, would you trust a vaccine that came from Putin? In fact, I saw circulating on social media all kinds of, you know, really uh, horrible types of jokes, you know, saying that, oh, if you take the Russian vaccine, you're going to start speaking Russian. I mean, it was just like really uh, amazing propaganda against uh, Russia. And then, in fact, the United States did sanction Russian institutions that were involved in the development of that vaccine. Um, the United States 
has uh, developed now two vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. These are both using new technology, the mRNA technology, and this requires the vaccines, or particularly the Pfizer one, requires uh, very extreme uh, cold temperatures in order to be stored. And so this limits how well this can be distributed, both in the United States, particularly our rural hospitals that don't have infrastructure, but very much around the world in uh, countries that are less developed than the United States. What we see in China and in Russia with their vaccine production is it's more using the standard technology of inactivated viruses or using adenoviruses to convey the genes to produce the proteins to develop an immune response. And these vaccines are much more stable. They don't require these high temperatures. And so they're much easier to distribute. So, um, you know, just a, a difference there in the technology makes a real difference in the availability of, of those vaccines. So I think with that, I want to stop my comments. Um, we're running a little bit over time. So I did want to give our panelists time to quickly respond about the vaccine, and hopefully we can get a few questions in. But I know in particular, um, Suhin, you wanted to speak about the, the vaccines in China and what you're seeing there. Go yes. ahead. Uh, Margaret, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let me try to uh, saying that uh, the vaccine right now, uh, China has uh, You know, so Hen, you're breaking up a lot. Maybe if you turn off your video, let's see if that works better. I'm sorry. Okay, sure. Let me try. Yeah. Can you hear Bella? Yes, much better. Okay, sure. Uh, so right now, over 20 million people have been vaccinated. Of course, uh, uh, China has 1.5 billion people. The government uh, forecasting that uh, by March, another several tens million, tens of millions of people will be vaccinated, and uh, that's the one that uh, uh, the putting the the fastest and most uh, uh, comprehensive vaccination program in the world, and uh, in comparison with the, what happened the chaos and in Europe and the U.S. One, one thing is very clear that public support at the vaccination are very high. And there's been a very specific uh, 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 also uh, priority. So first are medical workers. And the second priority has been uh, uh, cold chain workers and uh, the docking workers, which is I mentioned earlier that many uh, imported products has been found uh, uh, the COVID uh, strain. And uh, so that uh, the, the docking worker, transportation workers, and uh, 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 the, all these uh, cold chain workers are also the top priorities. So that has been uh, working very uh, uh, smoothly. Also, the public support are very high. And that's very few people, except the far right in China, uh, all this kind of, uh, other than that, most people support the vaccines. And also one thing, and despite the, the Western and US propaganda about the vaccines, over 20 countries has been or, have been ordering the Chinese vaccines and China have been showing the international vaccine solidarity by providing uh, uh, vaccines from uh, Europe to uh, 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 Middle East to Africa to uh, Asian countries and se uh, several uh, head of states from uh, Turkey, from Turkey, uh, from uh, United Arab Emirates uh, to Egypt to South Africa to Indonesia. Like the Indonesian president just uh, sh uh, took the Chinese uh, vaccines. So total another like a several dozens top government officials and uh, uh, and also uh, uh, the head of the state has had took the, the vaccine uh, Chinese vaccines so that the trust 
in the Chinese vaccine on many developing countries and many parts of the world, uh, even uh, wealthy nations uh, such as Serbia and uh, UAE has been uh, re-endorsing and supporting the Chinese vaccines. That ha not has been happening on the, what the US and European country has been a so-called vaccine nationalism, either they're not sending the vaccines or, 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 or delaying the, uh, the shipment to those countries, or they're using that as a weapon to blackmailing those countries from, uh, uh, from some kind of political concessions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Su Hin, for your comments. Um, I'd like to ask if there's anybody else from the uh, panel who would like to respond about the vaccines and the different philosophies uh, between various countries on the vaccines and how that's impacting the global health. Margaret, did you wanna say something? Yeah, just uh, very briefly, um, you know, somebody once said that the business of America is business. I can't remember who said it or when, but uh, that's certainly true. Um, we know that these vaccine makers are going to make a lot of money. Moderna and Pfizer are, are first out of the gate with these uh, emergency use authorizations. But we're seeing with the vaccine rollout what we saw, what we've seen all along this past year. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, first, we were told um, only certain people should get the vaccine and we're saving it for them. Then we hear that uh, vaccines are being thrown out and it's a problem that it's a two dose uh, process. Uh, here in New York, where I live, supplies are, are very low. But uh, the vaccine race is happening all over the world. Countries we've mentioned, China, Russia, Cuba, others have their own uh, vaccine, but once again, we are not told that they exist. Their efforts are ridiculed. Uh, China agrees to help poorer nations. Uh, we're told to be suspicious of them. The United States isn't helping anybody else, of course, but we always have to be concerned about the role of the big pharmaceutical companies. Um, once again, healthcare is subordinated to the profit motive. And these companies have no limits on how much money they can make. Um, and instead of having this hands-off approach, the government needs to be telling them what to do. But um, uh, that's the way things should run, but unfortunately uh, they do not. And uh, so I would say that is what we need to watch. We need to watch these pharmaceutical companies. We need to see if the Biden administration will uh, be different, not that much, I don't think, because uh, uh, the role of these corporations remains uh, uh, remain the same. So that is my concern about the vaccine and also about safety. It, it appears that there have been some adverse reactions, but largely there have not been. But I don't think people uh, should be dismissed and, sne dismissed and, and sneered at because they're hesitant to um, use these uh, vaccines that have been fast-tracked. As some of those fears are diminishing as the number of cases continues to grow, but uh, those, are, um, those are the issues that I'm uh, interested in with the vaccine. Thanks. Thank you, Margaret. Vijay, did you wanna make a comment? Yes, uh, I'm just going to make this comment, then I have to leave, unfortunately. But um, I wanted to say that the reason I brought up money and vaccines together is that countries are being forced to pay their bondholders for debt servicing with money that they could use to buy vaccines. Um, right now, the other phenomena which I'd like to put on the table is what some people are calling vaccine hoarding. So, for instance, Canada is actually the biggest scoff law here because the Canadians have bought enough vaccines to vaccinate each Canadian five times. Um, that's not necessary. You know, there's the vaccine and then the second vaccine. You don't need five shots, five jabs per person. But that's what the Canadians have done. The numbers so far show us that 14% of the world's population, that is the people in the richest countries in the world, the imperialist bloc, 14% of the world's population has now purchased 
effectively 53% of all available vaccines. I mean, this is all prior to the problems of the cold chain. You know, the Pfizer vaccine requires storage at 70 degrees below Celsius. Um, that's very hard for most countries to do because they just don't have the cold chain. But even before issues of the cold chain come in, you've already seen vaccine hoarding take place. Um, and I want you to consider that Canada, which has this grotesque reputation for liberalism, has just bought five vaccines per head, which they don't need. They only need two per head, and yet they have bought five per head. Let me ask you, why do the Canadians need five vaccines per head uh, when there are countries in the world where they just will not be allowed to buy them because the same countries, Canada, United States, etc., are going to insist that they service the debt when that money, which these countries have, they don't need bloody charity. They don't need philanthropy. They just need the debt to be totally cancelled, you know, and, and set the clock at zero. Um, if a wealthy banker goes bankrupt, they set their clock at zero in terms of through bankruptcy law. But countries like Zambia, Argentina, Lebanon, simply not allowed to bring their financial clock to zero. They are being penalized. This is a war against these countries, an economic war. These countries don't need charity. They don't need your sympathy. They don't need any of that. They produce their own wealth. What they need is the debt to be in immediately cancelled. Those who are going to fight against vaccine nationalism, to fight against vaccine hoarding, it's not enough to do that. You have to also fight to cancel the debt in total. $11.7 trillion totally cancelled. If you just fight against vaccine nationalism and vaccine hoarding, you'll end up in a kind of charity sphere. Let's find a way to get these countries' vaccines. These countries don't need your charity. They need your solidarity. And your solidarity has to be demonstrated by fighting to cancel the debt in some. Um, thanks a lot for having me tonight. Thanks, guys, for the book, and congratulations. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us. Bye. Max, did you have a comment about vaccines? Well, I don't know if it's been mentioned, um, but I think a good microcosm of apartheid that VJ mentioned is the policy of apartheid Israel towards all Palestinians living under occupation, which is to deny them vaccines while Israel is touted as a global leader in providing vaccines, which it has received more of or per person per capita than the United States government or the United States uh, our, than our country. Um, this is just textbook medical apartheid. Israel has military control over all Palestinians in the West Bank. 300,000 Palestinians in East Jerusalem have no citizenship either. They are residents technically of Jordan. And then you have 1.8 Palestinians living under sea. None of them have access to the vaccines, which are being rolled out at a very rapid rate to the Israeli population. Uh, many of these vaccines, by the way, were acquired through mysterious means by Israel's intelligence service, the Mossad. So I look at Israel not as a uniquely, but as a fiction of the most severe image of the West. And as VJ mentioned, there is a uh, oversupply of vaccines for countries that represent 14% of the world's population. The global North, partly with the fact that the US and US have resisted a patent pool, which would allow for vaccines to be rolled out in a more public fashion to global South countries. And therefore Pfizer, has sold primarily, it sold 80% of its vaccines to 14% of the world's population. Um, then you have a situation where Oxford University produced a vaccine COVID-19 early on. It wanted to put this vaccine on, it, make, make it the public good, just publicize the vaccine and allow um, countries and anyone who could produce it uh, to do so, start getting this virus under control globally. 
but the Gates Foundation of Bill and Melinda Gates stepped in, encouraged Oxford University researchers to privatize the vaccine and sell it exclusively to the big pharma giant AstraZeneca, which it did. Uh, the researchers stand to make an enormous profit, as do, does AstraZeneca. And the EU result of this privatization has seen a shortfall in vaccines produced by that company. So thanks to Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, uh, there's been a public health failure. And this is the agenda of Bill Gates is to privatize global medical systems and to, to turn out massive profits for the big pharma industry whose former directors and um, apparatchiks occupy many board member seats at the Gates Foundation. This is a really dangerous agenda. Bill Gates is a enemy of the global population and the media, which he's literally paying, spending tens of millions of dollars a year uh, to fund media, including an entire Guardian, is painting him as some heroic saint who's absolutely altruistic and wants to do nothing more than save the children of Africa. Uh, several months ago, I guess about a year ago, uh, there were people who were branded psychotic conspiracy for bringing up the possibility of vaccine passports. The idea that only people who would be able to travel or receive certain public services and be go out into the world, see that vaccines are being administered or made available to a privileged portion of the world's population, coming to discuss, and even the EU is beginning to discuss, uh, imposing passport restrictions, whereby people are refused entry to countries and public places unless they can provide a passport proving they were vaccinated, which is necessarily discriminatory. That's the world world we're entering. And I think based on this discussion, there, there, there is a better way and we have to move to resist this. Um, so they anyone who put on the talk, thanks to Sarah and Margaret, especially, and it's good to see everybody virtually. I hope we can all see each other today. Who knows Thank when you. that'll be. <laughs> Thank you. So I do want to take just a minute to address some of the questions that have come up in the uh, Q&A. And an, a number of them are kind of more medically oriented. Um, one asked about the technology of the Chinese vaccines. And uh, as far as I know, there are five vaccines currently, I think, being tested in China. One is a uh, an activated virus, which is a pretty typical technology. If you think of the injectable polio vaccine, it's an inactivated virus vaccine. Um, and then the other four are using adenovirus and it's where they put uh, genes from the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the adenovirus and get it to produce the uh, protein, the spike protein on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 that seems to be the one that when you induce immunity to that is effective. Um, so those are very traditional technology. The uh, Russian vaccine is also an adenovirus vaccine. And I forgot to mention that Johnson & Johnson in the US is now seeking approval, FDA approval for their vaccine, which is also an adenovirus vaccine. Not So none of those vaccines are mRNA, just the Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA. And that's a, that's a brand new technology. Someone asked about if you only get one dose of the vaccine, are you protected? Uh, right now, most of these vaccines are two dose, uh, and it depends on which vaccine you get. But uh, I've seen the numbers I've seen with the Pfizer is if you have just one dose of Pfizer, you're about a little over 50% protected. So what uh, people are recommending is that if you only have one dose of vaccine, that you should continue to consider that you can be infected and that you should continue to protect yourself, um, you know, wearing a mask and doing the other precautions that we're taking. Um, someone asked about the length of immunity, and the reality is we don't 
actually have an answer to that yet fully because it hasn't been that long. So um, it's something we definitely need to monitor because typically with coronaviruses, uh, we don't see long lasting immunity to that. So we'll have to see um, with this two dose regimen, how long that, that immunity is gonna last. Someone brought up the adverse reactions and I just wanna remind everyone that every vaccine um, causes adverse reactions in certain proportions of the population. But the reason that we use vaccines is because if you if you look at the benefit that you get from immunizing the population and stopping the disease, which has its own impacts on health, um, is generally viewed in most situations to outweigh the fact that there will be some adverse reactions and even deaths to some of the vaccines. But those numbers are small in comparison to the number of vaccines that are delivered. Um, someone asked about the mechanism of, of these kind of chronic disease with COVID. I think that was the question someone asked about uh, blood clots. And I think what people are finding is that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not so much a respiratory disease as people thought initially as it's actually a vasculitis, an inflammation of the blood system or the vascular system. And that's why you see the impacts in the lungs, the heart, the kidney, the liver, the brain. Uh, it's and even the pancreas with uh, insulin production. Um, it's from these these uh, vascular vascular effects. And then someone asked about ivermectin uh, as a drug for uh, treating COVID-19. Um, what I've been using in terms of looking at you know recommendations for treatment is the Eastern Virginia Medical School has a uh, on their website a COVID-19 treatment protocol. Uh, they're constantly updating it. They're looking at the studies. It seems to be really excellent. And they have added ivermectin. If I recall, they were recommending it for exposure and for mild disease, but not for severe disease. But there's a whole protocols there based on the severity of the, of the disease, and um, it, which I have looked at and seems to be fairly reliable. And then someone asked about information on China. And I think that um, Vijay Prashad's website, the tricontinental.org, as he mentioned, those various dossiers that they've done uh, is excellent. Uh, you can check out thegrayzone.com. Also check out blackagendareport.com. Um, you know, these are all excellent places to find information and as, as well, of course, popularresistance.org. Uh, we try to keep things up to date there too. But, um, and then the Chow Collective, I highly recommend. It's Q U, sorry, Q I A O, the Chow Collective. Um, provides information on what's happening in China. And I don't know if Suhin has other recommendations for where to get good information about China. Um, Suhin, did you want to add to that? Yes, yes uh, Margaret. Uh, I would say that uh, men, the, right now the, the translation is the issue, but the, uh, uh, if, we, if people want to uh, going to find some more medical information, I would say they're going to check some of the Chinese English media, such as the Global Times. So uh, it's the global times, uh, .cn, uh, org, uh, .com, .cn. And that is, uh, if you go into Google search, it's easier, it's a China Global Times. That's been many latest report, but also a treatment specific also China Daily. Uh, if you're going to uh, check the Google, you can find China Daily. It's not just only the news, but also uh, I want to raise one more issue that traditional Chinese medicines as an alternative of the treatment has been very helpful on fight the COVID, especially what happened on the Wuhan uh, treatment uh, last year. There has been uh, many traditional Chinese TCM doctors has been using uh, the traditional method to treat the patient have been worked very, very well. I'm in China and I see that uh, that also has been a different way to treatment. But the most important thing is uh, uh, not just only looking for uh, Western capitalist corporate hospital system treatment option, but also look for alternative and uh, options, not just only from China, but also from Cuba that have been worked very successful. Great, thank you so much. So we've uh, run out of time. Sarah, did you have any final comments uh, that you wanted to make? I, I just wanna say this is the exact hope um, in, in producing the book and doing the webinar tonight. How do we have our own voice? 
and not literally be just held captive, pulled along by the propaganda, which is whipped up against China and also whipped up in terms of this medical catastrophe in ways that terrify people. We want to show that there is a scientific approach and also that socialist cooperation and coordination can even something like a virus make it at least containable and controllable. Um, I thought, Margaret, what you raised on the difference in the two um, vaccines is very important. The U.S. has chosen a route which is a high-tech, patented, have to keep it super cold, only limited amount can be produced and produced over the next six and nine months. And China and also Cuba and Iran and Russia and a number of countries are producing the low-tech uh, vaccine, which is a standard well understood around the world. And uh, it's being hit with a lot of propaganda from the US. Oh, this isn't as effective. Uh, well, it, it's going to be a real changer. Uh, and, and China and also Cuba just committed, Cuba just committed to getting out 100 million doses. This is a country with a population of only 11 million. So they're willing to produce for the world and provide the doctors and the technicians. Uh, Vietnam has probably the lowest uh, in the world of, of COVID cases, just because they made it a national campaign, like their liberation struggle, to be free of this disease. So I think we want to learn a lot from the countries that really have something to teach beyond fear, superstition, racism, backwardness. Uh, the idea of not wearing masks, who cares about your neighbor? Uh, the idea of not providing vaccines to the world, who cares about your neighbor? It's all just for money. So I think uh, we really wanted to and hope to continue a discussion as to how cooperation, uh, and, and I'll say also in closing on where more information, so much information on popular resistance. Um, I uh, write for workers.org. Uh, and also material on International Action Center who helped in producing the book. Uh, I think uh, Suhin Lee made excellent suggestions that Chinese media, it's, it's not hard to find on, on Global Times and CGTV and, and so on. Black Agenda Report has articles all the time. Uh, the Gray Zone and Tricontinental, uh, there's a lot of material out there, and the more people are reading and thinking about this, uh, that's what we hope to accomplish. So thank you, uh, like to this whole panel, and to an approach, uh, an approach to say we can understand this and we can learn from it, and we're not going to be just pulled in tow to another war, to more sanctions, to less vaccines. So forward science and socialism and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, you can buy the book at, uh, the link is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash cap vent book with a capital C, a capital V and a capital B. Uh, or you can buy it at bit.ly slash cap vent ebook to get the E copy. It's, it's capital C, capital V, capital E and capital B. So. Um, or just Google the title and you'll find it. <laughs> so thank you uh, very much everyone to our panelists for being here this evening and to all of the participants for staying on a very long webinar. And you can find recordings of this at the Popular Resistance Facebook and YouTube channel if you'd like to share it out or watch it again. So thank you everyone and good night. And soon on Free Speech TV, I think also. That's right, we'll be airing on Free Speech We're TV. Looking forward to that. Right. And thank you to Abear for sharing this on Twitch. On Twitch, yes. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank Good you. Good night. Good night. Wonderful discussion. Yeah.